Innovation isn't just limited to Silicon Valley. My next guest join me to discuss how state and local governments are advancing mobility and transportation solutions closer to home. Margaret Anderson Kelleher is commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation and former speaker of the Minnesota House. She really knows the, that political world, and that's one element of this. And Dr. Joshua Shank is the first ever chief innovation officer of the Los Angeles County Metro. He previously served as president and CEO of the I can't, NO or ENO NO Center for Transportation. Yeah. I apologize. I probably uh, apologize if I got that wrong, but uh, th thank you both for joining us. Um, Joshua, I don't know if you heard any of my earlier um, interviews. I interviewed uh, uh, Vi Lyles, the mayor of Charlotte, and I opened it and I said, hey, did you ever watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit and about the competition in L.A. between the, you know, big, bad auto car vehicles and light rail, which got wiped out? And we had a fascinating discussion. So I just start with you and, you know, not you don't have to go from Roger Rabbit, but I know that you're like a creative visionary when you think about what we need to do in terms of carving a different transportation vision for the future and getting people to buy in. I'd love to ask you both about this from you know, Minnesota and from uh, LA County. You know, what are the things that, you know, as you're looking at the future, we have to get right? Um, we'll start with what to get right, and then you can tell me what we're getting wrong. Well, I mean, I can tell you both. The, the Los Angeles has the greatest transportation system uh, known to man. We're just using it in the, the least effective way we possibly could. So we've got pavement, as far as the eye can see, I'm looking out from my office right now, I can see pavement everywhere. We've got plenty of room for plenty of vehicles. Um, we're just uh, using it in an incredibly inefficient way, which is that everyone is driving around in their own personal vehicle um, at mm. any time that they please and making it so that no one can really get anywhere. And, and that's starting to become true even as, as the pandemic recedes, it's, we're seeing the traffic come back. So it's not that we have to uh, make some dramatic change in our infrastructure, though we are doing that and we're building out our transit system significantly and building rail all over LA County. It's that we need to use what we have more effectively and get more people into large vehicles. Uh, that Whether that's through bus lanes, hmm. whether that's through pricing the roads more effectively, um, or even if it's just providing sidewalks and, and uh, bike lanes so that people can choose to use modes other than driving alone, which is the predominant mode here in Southern California. Well, um, Margaret, I, I just want to ask you the same question, but I also want to know when you were, you know, serving in the house in Minnesota, were you transportation obsessed then, or was this a kind of later development? Well, I uh, actually got to spend about 10 years of my 12 years on the transportation and transportation finance committee. And uh, behind me in the picture, you will all see the beautiful new 35W bridge, which of course replaced uh, one of the most tragic moments in Minnesota transportation history, if not history, which was the collapse of the 35W bridge. I was Speaker of the House during that period and then mm. led uh, the override of our then governor to do a multimodal transportation investment uh, the year after that happened. And so I have, I have been transportation obsessed for a while. Uh, I took a little detour over to the tech world for 10 years. I led the Minnesota Technology Association. And actually I found your, your conversation with Alex really fascinating because of that, because I still uh, maintain some connections to the tech world and to the innovation world. You know, in Minnesota, you see also behind me the beautiful Minis Mississippi River. Mm. And, uh, you know, that I think is one of the things that really helps Minnesotans come together around what needs to change in transportation, because there's a really high value in this state on the outdoors, on water, on clean air. And the realization that transportation now has become our biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. And uh, we can talk more about that, but we're actually using a piece of policy that passed way back in 2008 uh, that really set the greenhouse gas levels for the state of Minnesota, first focused on the energy sector. And the energy sector has met their goals. Uh, the transportation sector has not. And so that's where a lot of this work uh, is coming out of is uh, the Next Generation Energy Act and some work that MnDOT has done over the last couple of years. 
That's fascinating. You know, you know I, I want to go back to Joshua a minute, but you know, I, I was sort of listening to both of you, and I understand you're just both kind of wired differently than the normal human, that you think about you know, transportation networks a lot, and, and I get that. And so as I was reading about Joshua's work, you know, the, one of the areas that he's got, also got to think about is this crazy Sepulveda Pass corridor from the valley to the west side. I went to UCLA. I'm very familiar with that freeway. Uh, I think I left Los Angeles because of that freeway strip, because it was, I've been spent too much of my life you know, stuck in traffic there. But as you dream up solutions to these things in your you know, dreams or nightmares, how are you solving, you know, how, how do you think about bringing together the equities, like something like that, that's, that has literally been a multi-generation challenge, Josh? Well, what we're doing on Sepulveda is uh, what I hope will be a model for future mega projects uh, around the country. Because typically, a I mega mean, and it is a like mega this. project, right? It is a mega, oh, okay. mega project. Well, just for people who aren't aware, we've got two million people on one side of a mountain, and then two and a half million people on the other side of the mountain. And there's about five different paths that you can take to get from one to the other, all of which are completely clogged, and the most famous of those being the 405 freeway. Uh, so the, the, this is intended to be a rail line that would connect those two major population centers, which includes UCLA, which is the largest population center on the west side of Los Angeles. And what we're trying to do on this mega project is shift some of the risk for this project, because there are huge risks with any big infrastructure project like this, uh, but particularly when you're trying to go through a mountain in the middle of a major urbanized area, the risks are astronomical, and we don't want to wind up with a situation where it takes 20, you know, 10, 20, 30 years to build this and, and cost overruns and all those things. We're trying to get that out of the way up front by bringing the private sector on earlier on in the process through what we call a pre-development agreement. And we actually have two teams that are going to be competing uh, for the right to design, build, finance, and operate, and maintain this project hmm. and see which one of them can come up with a design that's more feasible and gets us where we want to go uh, more quickly. Um, it's never been tried before um, in the United States and, on a transit project, and it's really exciting and you know, hopefully help us solve this, this big challenge. I mean, I'm very excited by it. I want to see how it goes. But Morgan, let me ask you, when you kind of think about Minnesota, you know, the big topic in Washington right now and it's being discussed right now with the president of the United States. And, you know, he's meeting it right now with uh, 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 Mitch McConnell and uh, uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy. And they're discussing infrastructure, you know, and how to get a compromise. Going. How, when you kind of have been looking at uh, from your own lens of the infrastructure bill that may be coming down the pike, what equities do you care most about? What are the things that policymakers in this town need to hear from you about aligning correctly with what communities really need, particularly in Minnesota? I think it's such a great question. It really uh, hits at the heart of where transportation broadly needs to go into the future. And it's really about that equity piece that you know we do have so many examples around the country where low power communities, where BIPOC communities were harmed by transportation projects mm. in the past. Indigenous populations in places like Minnesota where we have a number of uh, Native American tribes. And so one of the things that we're looking to, uh, a project in particular that we are focused on, is the corridor between Minneapolis and St. Paul. And it's almost staggering to hear Joshua talk about the size of population. Of course, here we have our two major cities and the I-94 corridor that runs between them. And we are doing really a rethinking of how we are going to do that project in the next 10 years. What is it going to mean? Uh, transit inside the project, uh, including most likely uh, a form of bus rapid transit, but we're not certain of that right now. But the biggest thing is connecting the historic Rondo community in St. Paul, which is the African-American community that was decimated by the building of I-94, low power community at the time that uh, really took away black wealth. And so we see that as an opportunity, the focus on reconnecting communities. The focus on climate is very important in this transportation infrastructure investment. We only get 
one of these about every 50 to 60 years, it looks like in the United States at this level. And so being able to make sure that not only are we doing things that are safety focused for folks who are gonna keep using their individual vehicles, uh, making sure our roadways are safe and accessible, but we also have to do what Josh was talking about with making sure, I mean, I'm a transportation leader of a DOT that talks about to make progress, we need to have more transit into our future. And so we need options. People want options. It makes them happier to have transportation options. And so that I think is probably some of the biggest takeaways is making sure that whatever happens in Washington, D.C., options are available. Joshua, you know, to that point of options and things that you would like to have that you can't have today, uh, in as you lay out, what are what are some of the big um, aspirational goals in transportation that you'd like to add to the scene that you might not be able to have at this moment? Well, I mean, I think that the number one goal that that we have that that I've kind of articulated already is uh, how can we better price the roads in Los Angeles, right? Mm. Because and that's why we're, we've undertaken this traffic reduction study that's looking at using congestion pricing along with uh, a combination of other major mobility improvements to provide people with the options um, that, that we've been talking about and and give those options to people combined with a road pricing uh, structure that will actually mitigate demand a little bit and, and spread the demand out throughout the day could make a huge difference in so many people's lives very quickly. Um, and it is also an equity issue because right now our buses are stuck in the same traffic as all the other cars. And those buses are with people who are primarily low income and people of color, and they're not going anywhere. And they have commutes that are much worse than people in single occupancy vehicles. Now, no one's commute is very good, uh, but the traffic reduction study aims to rebalance that a little bit and make it so that all the, the commutes can get better. All right, our goal is to get a pilot program going uh, within the, the County of Los Angeles in the next few years. It's really exciting. Can I, just, just in conclusion, I want to ask you both just a, a question that's a little bit outside of transportation. It's more about you know, how societies connect and see themselves, how communities. And I guess, to be honest, when I lived in L.A. for 20 years, we had parts of town that could conveniently forget about other parts of town. Uh, we had, uh, there was a disregard kind of built in. And you had a freeway, you could drive right, right over it, um, essentially. Is it important to create new pathways, I mean, in pathways so that communities kind of learn to carry with each other, see each other? I, mean, I, I don't mean to be hokey, but I do think in this world where things are very divided, and there's a toxicity in the country, whether or not communication can become part of re-sowing uh, uh, cities back together, because I think they've been divided for a long time and we're just sort of realizing it now. But but I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think that's, yeah. A, that's a huge issue. I mean, as someone who, who lived on the East Coast for the first 40 years of my life yeah. before I came out here, it's been a shock to me how divided things can be when, when so many people are confined to their vehicles. Right. Uh, if you look at, um, at the uh, income and, and racial makeup of people on the New York City subway, it's pretty much aligned with the rest of the city. Here, that's not true. Hmm. And, uh, and that's got to change. I mean, I was on the subway this morning coming here uh, to my office in downtown Los Angeles, and I saw um, a woman help a homeless man who was struggling to get a mask uh, from our mask dispenser and, and, and get it on. And that's the kind of communal thing that happens and, and the benefit that happens when you mix people on public transit that just right. doesn't happen when, when rich people are isolated and right. their, their Tesla's driving all around the city. So I do think it, it matters. I do think it makes a difference uh, in the psychological makeup and in the harmony uh, of a community. Right. And Margaret, your thoughts on this? Well, I think that Minnesota has been really front and center and a poster right. child in the last year for under, helping people understand that not everything is equal in our country, nor is it equal here in Minnesota. And the equity issues that have been exposed by the murder of George Floyd, by the murder of Dante Wright recently, 
have, I think, awakened in people that they we need to care about each other and we need to take an active role in that care. And transportation is a key piece of that. Transportation is the thing that weaves us together. And it does matter to all Minnesotans whether that transportation system works, whether you live in Duluth, Minnesota, or you live in the Twin Cities or Rochester, Minnesota, who Hmm. is uh, you know, working forward with their connected and automated vehicle program. This all makes a difference. And uh, it has, it has, I think, uh, made us wake up to being able to say, you know, there are uh, places that do not share equally in wealth. Hmm. They do not share equally in opportunity. In fact, uh, this one statistic sticks with me. If you are a Minnesotan who does not have access to a car or a transit opportunity, you can only access 11% of the jobs in the region in the Twin Cities. That is a shameful statistic. Mm -hmm. We got to change that. And one of the ways we're going to change that is with this historic investment and infrastructure that's coming. You both have really cool jobs. I find it fascinating uh, to to sort of think about uh, these issues with you. Um, You know, we've been talking to a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators, but I also think, you know, the policy architects are are a very, very important part of this picture. So Joshua Shank, uh, Chief Innovation Officer of the Los Angeles Metro, and Margaret Anderson Kelleher, uh, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation, former Speaker of the House. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, it was fun.